Hello and welcome everyone. I'll just wait for a minute or two to allow some more participants to join in. Hello everyone and welcome to Crossref's annual meeting. Okay, right then. Let's get started. Um, my name is Madhuram Dekar and I am a community engagement manager at Crossref. I will be your host and moderator for this session. Um, we also have Isaac Farley, who's the technical support manager at Crossref, who will be monitoring the chat and helping us with the question and answer session. Um, thank you for joining us in today's session on community updates, where we'll be hearing from our community members about their stories and initiatives related to metadata improvement. Um, I'm going to just start sharing my screen so that we can begin with some announcements. Perfect. Um, so we hope that um, this session will be welcoming and inclusive for everyone, and it will be according to Crossref's code of conduct. Um, we are also on uh, social media. We are on Mastodon and X. So please join the conversation using the ha uh, hashtag Crossref2023. Um, if you have a question during the presentation for any of our speakers, uh, please write it in the Q&A box, uh, not in the chat, so that it will be easier for us to keep track and for others to see your questions. Uh, you can also raise your hand to ask a question, and then we'll be able to unmute you so that you can ask your question live. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the recordings will be shared with you afterwards. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started. Um, we had invited our community members to share their experiences and initiatives related to metadata and metadata improvement and, um, and how they collect it, how they use it, and thoughts on how they can improve upon it. So the presentations in this session are an answer to that call and we are very excited to hear from each and every one of them. Uh, we have five flash talk presentations in this session. Um, each, pre each presenter will have approximately five to seven minutes to share their presentation. And we'll also be able to take some questions from the audience, depending on the time. Um, if there are any questions that are left, we'll be happy to take them at the end of all the presentations. Joining me today are uh, Christina Fraunwelder from AGU, uh, Angelo Shezenelaj from Real University College, Edelson Damasio from Moringa State University and who's also a Crossref ambassador, uh, Joanne Fogelson from the American Society of Civil Engineers, and Amanda French uh, from ROAR. So I'll now pass this on, uh, I'm sorry, to our uh, first speaker, who is Christina uh, Fraunfelder from AGO. Uh, Christina, over to you, I'm sorry. Uh, thanks very much. I'm happy to be here today. I'm actually here on behalf of CORUS and the American Geophysical Union representing our project team. Um, and I want to give a big shout out to Tara Packer, who um, really did uh, the majority of the work preparing this poster. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a joint project between CORUS and the AGU and a number of other, of other project partners uh, that was funded through the National Science Foundation and kicked off in 2020. This work was designed to enhance uh, the linkages between uh, AGU's publications. We published 23 journals in the Earth and Space Science and our authors' data sets and NSF funded research. Uh, so we kicked this project off with the intention of implementing data citation as a mandatory policy in each and every one of our AGU journals. And uh, we wanted to make sure at the same time that when we are asking authors to uh, publish their data sets uh, at the same time as their papers and link those to their papers, that they were going to be able to get um, credit for that work. And at the same time, we wanted to see if we could uh, report back to the funder, to the NSF, uh, about research that was published in HU journals and the data sets associated with that. This project really had two different prongs on the AGU side, uh, which is the side I'm more familiar with. Uh, we implemented a policy of asking authors to publish data sets in the, at the same time as their AGU journals uh, to cite those data sets in their AGU publications. And we had to, at the same time as implementing this policy, develop a good deal of guidance for our authors, for our editors, for our reviewers, and for our staff to make sure that this project could be successful. 
Uh, we found that it was not enough to just ask authors to cite their data. They really needed to be taught how to do this in um, a way that facilitated uh, credit. Most authors however, were not familiar with the idea of uh, citing data with a DOI and including a reference in the data in the reference se section of the paper. Uh, we also f created a good deal of guidance for our editors and for our reviewers, uh, because our editors are really the first people to read papers and to look for data sets, and they're the best equipped to um, identify when a data set is missing. And then finally, uh, the grant allowed us to uh, really create guidance for our staff, our editorial staff, who are providing operation support uh, for each paper that's published in AGU journals. Uh, throughout the course of this project, we've um, actually increase the amount of staff time spent on each paper published with AGU. So actually staff now look at each paper to make sure that citations are formatted correctly for data sets, uh, the data availability statement, the human readable component of each paper that describes where data is available is, is done properly. And this has been a big lift for staff, but has been a huge component of the success of this uh, project. Uh, so over the uh, course of incorporating more AGU journals into the, our data citation pilot, We've seen uh, the number of papers in EGU that contain a data citation go from about 30% at the beginning of this project uh, to over 60%. Uh, so a huge increase in the number of authors who are actually sharing data alongside their paper. Now let me talk a little bit about Chorus's work here. Uh, Chorus has been a really important project partner for this grant. Uh, we have pretty standard ways uh, to look on the AGU side, on our um, operations side, at whether or not authors are including data sets in their papers. But we really, at the onset of this project, had no way to connect through uh, from that citation to Crossref, to paper metadata, to data sets, to actually identify whether or not citation was working properly in uh, the publication infrastructure. And this was really important to us because when we implemented data citation at AGU journals, one of our promises for authors was that if they were originating a data set and publishing it with their paper and someone else reused or cited their data set, that they would see that, that they would get that credit uh, for uh, their data set being reused. Um, if the data sets are not actually um, uh, making it through the system, that was not that credit was not possible. So courses, what Chorus has done is to use open APIs uh, from a number of different sources, including Skull Explorer, Data Site, and Crossref to build a series of reports for AGU that link each AGU publication with the data set behind that publication, and then to link it through paper and data set metadata to the funding that supported that publication and that data set. Um, these reports are really comprehensive and have been very valuable for us, not only in looking at data sets and publications, but we can actually look at where authors are choosing to share their data. Um, since the chorus reports uh, began, uh, since we began this project of increasing data citations and AGU publications, we've seen an almost doubling in the number of data sets identified for AGU published content uh, reporting on funded research. So not just National Science Foundation, but for all funded research. Uh, we've also, as I said, seen a huge increase on the AGU side in the number of data citations for papers. Um, a few other interesting things, as I mentioned, uh, Chorus's reports allow us to see where authors are sharing their data. Uh, so since this project began, um, we've seen usage of certain repositories um, like Zenodo double every year as we increase the number of authors who are sharing their data in AGU journals. Um, they're looking for easy um, and efficient ways to share that data. Um, and we've seen them increasingly turning to free and fast solutions like um, Zenodo. Uh, we've um, seen that for other generalist repositories as well, but the Noto particularly stands out. Uh, we've also seen uh, a few really interesting things from the chorus reports uh, that I really like to uh, look at. Um, our oldest data set that's been shared uh, in an AGU paper uh, is from 1977. Uh, so a data set from 1977 was cited in a 2011 AGU paper. Um, the second oldest data set uh, shared in Pangaea in 1987 was cited in a 2016 paper. And that data set described uh, Arctic sea ice and hydrochemical parameters in the water ice layer. Uh, to see these data sets being used in papers that have been published in um, the last decade uh, was really exciting to us. But we don't have a solid way to look at data set reuse beyond these course reports yet. 
Uh, but the whole point of data citation in our minds is to allow authors to get credit for the work that they're doing creating data and also to facilitate scientific discovery by making sure that rare and useful data is available and out there to use for generations to come. Uh, we uh, are really looking forward to continuing our data citation pilot at AGU. We've just enrolled our last and biggest journal um, in August in this pilot. Um, so all papers that are published in um, GRLs now uh, must include a data set citation if there's data that underlies the work. And by the end of 2024, we're continuing these reports, of course, and we're continuing to look at our internal metrics. So we're hoping to see the number of data citations in AGU journals um, kick off even more. Uh, we're always looking for ways to uh, better link me the metadata of AG journals and data sets and uh, to report back to funders on this as well to en uh, encourage to them the importance of data and software citation. Uh, so this work uh, will be ongoing and uh, we, <laughs> we hope it'll be just as successful in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christina. Um, it looks like we have a question uh, from Christopher Popovich. Looks like you've got your hand raised. I'm going to promote you so you can speak, Christopher. You may need to unmute, but uh, you should be able to speak now, Christopher. Okay. Christopher, can okay. It looks like you've unmuted, Christopher. Um, still can't hear it. Okay, there, there you go. Now that was a mistake. I must have hit the button. <laughs> Sorry for any info. Oh no worries. Um, if there's any other questions for Christina, you could put them uh, into chat or raise your hand, and we can promote you to speak. Okay. Uh, in the interest of staying on time, maybe Madeira, maybe we move on to the next speaker. Yeah. Thank you so much, Isaac. Thank you, Christina, yeah. for that wonderful presentation. Um, our next speaker is uh, Angelouche Zinalaj from the Real University College. Um, welcome, Angelouche, and uh, over to you, please. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, hello to everyone. Thank you for having this opportunity. I am PhD in Jelusha Zanelai, and I am the chief editor of the Bulletin Scienzo Real. It's a scientific journal that is published by University College Real Flor. Actually, being indexed in Crossref was something like impossible for us about six months ago, but now it's a reality. Uh, so if you see the title of my poster presentation, it's Index Crossref Integrity Professional and Institutional Development. We have called or we have named this presentation like this because some times ago this was an objective for our institutions. Uh, we know that especially in the Western Balkans, it's difficult about the publication of scientific research and being able to publish also in the some other platforms that are very well known by the higher prices and that classic methods of publication just put them as pdf on the websites of the universities of, of the journal it was really difficult to identify the authors to use them as reference etc so we have decided to start uh, this objective and to realize the index in crossref attending uh, the code doi for the journal uh, for the volumes of the journal and also each uh, the code for each paper that is published. Actually, indexing in Crossray for our journal has made possible for published works to be protected, to be safer and more visible to other researchers. But also this is very important for the progress of our scientific journal as well as for the growth and the interna internationalization. And at the same time, uh, this objective for our institution that has been achieved and fulfilled now is also, uh, I would like to uh, underline the fact that the collaboration for the indexing process between our institutions and the organization of the Crossref were, is, were, uh, was very easy. So you have made our job 
uh, very easy for us because uh, since uh, the fact that it was our first time uh, and uh, the job must be step by step, uh, we have tried to accomplish all the criteria that has come as a recommendation from the CrossRap. But uh, thanks to the indexing process of the CrossRap, actually we are available to be indexed in some other platforms for the scientific research. For example, after attending the CrossRap indexation, uh, we are now indexed at the Copernicus platform. And we have also we have taken a factor impact from that platform. And actually, we are working to be a member of the DOI. So in the terms of the internationalization, this was a very good objective and a good, it was hard challenges for us, but now it's a reality. Also, being indexed in Crossref has increased the standards and the integrity of the authors. Because when you search on the Google, for example, that is more easy, uh, and you are searching for a scientific paper, you can be more easy identified if you are indexed in Crossref. Or for example, uh, the journal now that is indexed on Crossref also is added automatically at the platform of ResearchGate. So being in all this place at the same time is more easy, has increased the standards, also the integrity, the responsibility of any, uh, uh, of any author that publish a research or a paper, and also has give us uh, an opportunity to be indexed in some other platforms like Copernicus or DOI. Uh, at the same time, thanks uh, for the process of um, cross in, uh, indexing in Crossref, we have been registered now at the Web of Science and the status of our journal is also under evaluation. And uh, another thing is that uh, has been increased the interest of authors for the publication at our journal. I would like to um, specify all this and to mention all this uh, thanks to Crossref because uh, it's the academic field is something, uh, it's a professional development, individual and at the same time institutional. So the institution creates the opportunity uh, preparing all these uh, criteria for the index process. And at the same time, any author, any researcher, anyone that works in the academic field, when you have these standards, uh, you feel more uh, to do as much as you can according to the integrity. Now it's more easy because um, the work of the author is identified, is well identified, and at the same time, it is protected also by the law uh, with the right of the author. So this was a short case. It's my first time being member at the Crossref, first time for our journal, but I think and I hope that we go on with this collaboration. I don't know if anyone would have any question. No written questions. If you if you do have questions, feel free to raise your hand. Congratulations. Thank you for that. Thanks for sharing. Um, sounds like you've made a lot of progress and uh, yeah, we appreciate your hard work. Um, yeah, if, if anybody, uh, if any, if any attendees do have questions, anything comes to mind, feel free to drop that in the Q and A now or throughout, uh, throughout the session, we can always, uh, have questions later on as well. If there's no questions. We can move on to the next presenter, Madara. Thank you, Isaac. And thank you, Dr. Angelushe for that wonderful presentation. It was really nice to know about all the work that you've been doing. Um, our next speaker is Edelson Damasio, who's a Crossref ambassador as well as represents Moringa State University. Um, over to you, Edelson. Um, Edelson, I. I think you're on mute. Can you uh, please try to unmute yourself? Hello, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, I would very, very like to thank you to, to the audience of uh, Anobi team. Um, I have been a, a Crossref ambassador since uh, 20, uh, 2018. Uh, in Brazil, I, uh, I am uh, executive editor about uh, the Mathematics Journal. 
And in the participate in meetings in Brazil from uh, presented to, to COSEF in, related to publishing industry and in my area from research is research integrity. Okay. And it's about to re reflect on our uh, database. He, uh, the CrossRef is uh, adquired to reflect on our it's and the available to of open access to the data is a great news. Okay. Uh, and the, the scientific uh, community already in, in, in the world uses the uh, Retraction Watch database since its uh, launch in 2018. The study uh, uh, will, I will present uh, was taken from Retraction Watch and the previous presentation and the the World Conference on Research Integrity, Label Cree 2022, in Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, I am currently uh, carrying uh, analysis and in retracted watching for future presentation. And this work presents a brief study with quanti quantitative analysis, analysis of Brazilian authors in the Tech to Watch database. Uh, this study uh, was conducted at the end of 2021 and uh, identified 116 retraction uh, of Brazilian of articles with Brazilian authors or co-authors between 10 years. Uh, 2016 to 21. And an archive was downloaded in CSV format and worked at Excel for, for a quantitative analysis, okay? Uh, here is a summary of the main results. Uh, uh, the number of extraction in Brazil is stable, okay? Which approximately approximately 20 retractions per, per year. Which, uh, in the, the graphic, the exception of 2016. It's, uh, it's because uh, caused by a research group, which a large number of retraction in Brazil in the diabetes area, okay? The number of selections is very low, okay? How, uh, how the word is very long. And this number, uh, uh, H6 retraction of the articles uh, were identified by Brazilian authors. And the third uh, retractions were co-authored to Brazilian to authors, authors countries. Right? And in the results, the main uh, publications area is medicine with 31% biochemistry 23, biology 14, medicine diabetes, it's 11, dentistry 8, microbiology and phys 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 psychology, okay, by person, and the areas, human areas and social areas, is the one person and the others. It's very common to biomedical areas uh, with retraction because the, uh, the number of publication is very, its number is of publications and in this area, uh, they're working a lot with, uh, with data, okay? And the suggest the number of retraction is, is better, okay? A number, uh, it's, it's interesting, it, uh, in analysis, a number of, uh, total number of 276 reasons, okay, from retraction. And in the present distributed, uh, in the top 15 reasons, in the graph, okay? 
And the number is duplication of image with 25 uh, reasons, okay? Investigation by journal or publishers, uh, 17. Concerns issues about data. It's a very, very important, um, 16. Duplication of the article, duplication of publication. It's very common, okay? Um, uh, duplication of publication. It's very common in Brazil and the other areas of the world, okay? And error by journal publisher, uh, heavy errors, okay? Investigated by company or institution or funder with uh, 11. Which there are how uh, um, upgrade, update in of prior notes, the error methods with one uh, nine, okay, and the others. And uh, the question about uh, uh, attractions from uh, from replace, for example, plagiarism of the article, it's uh, a number very low, okay, because plagiarism have. Uh, software or, or system with uh, similarity checking, CrossF and the others. The conclusion, uh, uh, the highest number of interaction of articles Brazilian authors were in the areas of medicine and bio, biomedical areas. The most common reason for retraction was duplication, uh, followed by error, and fabrication of uh, error and uh, of data. And the classical in research integrity, if FFP, uh, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. Okay, in this area of research integrity, the number is FFP. And the, uh, the retraction of the database is. Uh, is a valuable research for tracking and analyzing retraction for, of scientific publications. Not only retraction, retractions, notices, and concerns about uh, articles and publication. It's it's resource for from retraction of the database. Uh, and the quantitative analysis of Brazilian authors provide uh, insight in the prevalence on, and the trends of retractions in Brazil. It's a study only in Brazil, okay? It's uh, necessary for, for authors, country, and the retraction watch is available in open, open access. And thank you very much to everyone. Uh, for the presentation and uh, disponible for any question. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Adilson. Don't see um, any written questions in the Q and A. Um, if anyone would like to unmute and ask questions, please do so. Adilson, that that's uh, your findings are really interesting. It'd be great to see how those compare with um, other areas of the world. And and my, my future uh, uh, study, I uh, I am uh, I am working to how register in detection of database. Um, part five thousand more for for five thousand, and and the uh, the comparison from from various countries, various regions. And uh, uh, I present, I, I send you to presentation in the next DEPR uh, World Conference of Research Integrity in, uh, in Atenas, Grecia. It's, uh, it's, it's a big <laughs> analysis. What's our, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we'll you. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll keep our eye out for that. Thank you, Adilson. Okay. Uh, Madeira, I don't, oh, here's an open question. Let's see. 
Uh, for Adilson, interesting that duplication is the major cause of retractions in, in Brazil. I wonder if you know how that compares to, to other regions. It sounds like you have that planned. Um, so we should be on the lookout for, for that analysis. It sounds like Adilson. Anything more to say about that, that question? Uh, in the other studies, uh, um, and the 20, 2010 to to the, the the moment, duplication of the uh, duplication is duplication for publication. Okay, um, it's very common. Okay, because uh, the the uh, the utilization from um, similar check or others, uh, others uh, plagiarism software, it's no no check all the time to duplication as of submissions. Okay, and the uh, and the filter is very necessary because and the the duplication of Publication are identified 20, uh, 20, no, a one, two, three, four before, um, no, after to the publication. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a common and the, it's a big number from, from the duplication of the articles. And the duplicate of, of images is the, in Brazil is the the very very number of attractions because to the um in 2016 a group of researchers in in medicine diabetes have a lot a duplication of mais in Brazil from from others others articles okay yeah, you, there's one other question here, and we'll just do this one and then move on to the next Maduro. But the most recent question is, I think you're starting to touch on there, is um, are institutions in Brazil responsive in taking up investigations of such malpractice that leads to retractions? Sounds like you're saying yes in some cases. Yes. The, um, it's common in Brazil, others, uh, others country, and... and it's necessary to um, to the, the, the institutions, uh, universities or institute of research, and funders to uh, to identify the, the, the retractions. And the retraction watch database is the it's the the very way from from the retraction because uh, the data of a retraction watch database is uh collected by by publications and authors uh, and the, from news in the 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 area of research is it's various and uh, it's necessary to uh, to authors research to to communicate from institutions or universities about uh, misconduct in science, uh, okay? All the time, all the time. In Brazil, we have uh, funders from uh, mapping to the retraction uh, from misconduct, and the, the, the authors have uh, uh, stopped to the, to the um, to the to the publication for years or stop to the to the grants, okay? It's the uh, it's very common. But the number it's it's very important because the number of retraction is very low. All the world is very low because have uh, very problems from on retraction uh, uh, to 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 see very problems. For example, an article from with uh, 200 uh, citations, okay? 200 citations from an uh, article with error or with duplication of image, it's, uh, uh, it's a very problem in science. Thank you, Adios, and Medora, mm -hmm. back to you. 
Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Adelson, for sharing those insights with us. Um, our next speaker is Joanne Fogelson from the American Society of Civil Engineers, and who's going to tell us about, now that you've published, what do you do with metadata? So over to you, Joanne. Hi, my name is Joanne Fogelson. I'm with the American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, ASCE was founded in 1852, and it's one of the largest um, engineering societies in the nation. Um, ASCE Publications publishes um, 35 um, hybrid journals and one open access journals. And we also publish between 30 and um, 20 to 30 eBooks standards and proceedings a year. Next slide. Um, when I was thinking about, um, now that you've published with your, your, your article, What Do You Do?, I started thinking about the way um, metadata is kind of like um, the DNA of a flower and how it needs to be shared. And um, I thought about it a little longer and I thought that um, the metadata, while it's the flower, the publishers are kind of like the pollinators. Next slide. Um, so the author has an idea, they create a draft, they submit it, they have the editorial and the review and they're accepting the article. And then it's published. And then what happens? What happens to the metadata or where does it go? Um, how does the publisher nurture it and grow the flower? So next slide. And like I said, um, I'm thinking as the publisher, as a pollinator, and that we have to take the metadata and spread it around. Um, next slide. So the publisher does the uh, metadata by registering DOIs. We um, have machine aiding indexing for the taxonomies. We do metadata deposits. We allow search engines to call the, call the metadata if it's online. We create um, comprehensive mark records. We participate in gay arts. We have Excel sheets that um, for um, uh, people that are not able to do the uh, other kind of uh, data extractions can have the Excel sheets. We have marketing campaigns and advertisers. We show it on social media, um, review copies, all of this information that helps spread the metadata and pollinate the metadata to other um, distribution channels. Um, the, the parts that are near and dear of my heart are the SEO, search engine optimization, and um, the using PIDs, PIDs, or persistent identifiers. Um, this helps with keeping that metadata intact so that when it does spread and grows, um, those are sourced to take it to. Um, along with making sure your XML is clean, that you're using a standard like bits or jets or STS for standards, um, that you, um, one thing we're starting to look in is to talk to using the credit taxonomy. So the author metadata um, carries on also. Um, you also have to figure out about in for depositories and make sure that your metadata is clean enough that even if it changes, it's accepted by these depositories. Um, next slide. One of the things, reasons why I think search engine depositories are, or search engine optimization is so important is because it does help with the increased discoverability of your paper. Um, it shows, it'll show up with relevant searches, it'll help with tracking and analysis, and it helps the author um, grow their citations also. Next slide. The best way to um, help with the SEO is have something like um, the Google Tag Management or um, Dublin Core um, initiated into your search and your paper. It's usually above the metadata. It's a metadata tag that you have on it, and it helps with um, tagging such things as abstracts and titles and authors so that the search engines, not just Google, can read it and see the important stuff of your paper, the heading of your paper. Next slide. The other thing that I said was, near and dear to my heart is persistent identifiers. Um, it's a long lasting reference, like a DOI that keeps that document, whether it be the paper, the author, the institution intact. So you can always follow it and you always know where it is. Next slide. Um, as I said, there are many examples of PIDs. The first one we all um, in publishing come to know and love is the ISBN. Any book you pick up hopefully has it. And that was kind of like the, the first identifier that kept the information to the book. We have DOIs, we have permalinks, we have ORCIDs, we have grant IDs and funder IDs. Next slide. Along with 
Roars and Ringgolds and um, data sites. Um, next slide. Then we also have a list of academic databases and search engines. And these are places where our metadata has to be clear enough and clean enough that when we provide it to them, they can deposit it nice and easily so that um, OCLC can catalog it and all the other um, search databases that you're using can catalog it. Um, even individual libraries who don't use a, a search database and use their own um, ad hoc systems will be able to view your metadata. And then, as I said, having consistent metadata using JATS or BITS or STS helps with the curation and the, the um, spreading of your metadata. Um, kind of like the, the V spreads the pollen around. Um, next slide. Um, the other thing about good metadata is that it um, could be saved in a persistent archive like Portico or Clock. So if something happens that your metadata, um, your your uh, your site crashes or your site is down for a year or some unmistakable thing that happens, um, researchers and other people can see your um, data in its original form and find all the data points that are connected to it. Next slide. The other thing you should always have to help with the spreading and the pollination of your metadata is a metadata management plan. And this is something we are actually just starting at ASCE. Um, you wanna make sure that you can go back and verify PIDs when possible and that you can add them to the existing metadata. You wanna have a data inventory to make sure that you're um, using the correct tags. And those can change over years, as we know, since um, things grow and um, tags are used in different ways. Um, you want to make sure your data is enriched um, and that um, you're following GDPR protections and the changing ones. Um, next slide. The other thing we're just working on is also having accessible metadata. And that's so that um, the things like the um, um, alt tags and enhanced descriptions and um, cues to help um, accessibility are there in your metadata. And this could be done through the editorial process or through AI. Next slide. And basically um, it's the, the data that you would see on the old um, print books where it says this page is intentionally um, left blank. On um, all, Without using alt text in a digital world, you would not know that this page was intentionally left blank link because it is basically just an article. Yes, your PDF might have a little bit more information on it, but using alt text helps for um, accessible readers and, um, and information that would um, display. It also helps that if you're using an AI alt text, the, um, the, the um, AI would grow with the alt text. So instead of just saying, um, this is a spiral notebook that has a blank text. It would say this is a spiral notebook with white paper with black text that reads and then what it the, the text says. Um, next link. Um, I also have some um, interesting reads that have helped me with my metadata journey and my pollination quest. Um, the, um, I just wanted to list them here in case anybody was interested. And um, that's about all the next slide that I have. Um, but I think that, like I said, that um, that growing your metadata and and making sure that it's accessible and easily to find and uniformly um, available so that your discovery units can get it and you would help with the great way of um, uh, pollinating your metadata. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joanne. What a lovely metaphor. Um, I'm curious about the data inventory. Can you can you speak to that process and and how often that occurs and what resources you use for that? We're actually just starting it. It's something we haven't done, but um, a lot of the a lot of this had to do with we did a legacy project where we brought in our 1800s and early 1900s um, journals and proceedings papers into our library, our digital library, and with those we use very basic information. Uh, but now we have to go back and um, do the connections between the discussions and closures and then the papers themselves. And one of the things we've noticed is that with our discussion and closures and, and erratums, we're not always um, um, tagging them the same way. 
And that was one of the metadata cleanups that we'll have like a, a spreadsheet saying, this is what we use for this. And then we go back and, and clean that up. And thankfully it's a lot easier than it was in the beginnings of metadata cleanups. And we just have to do a, a search and replace, but um, it's it's a, a big job because you want to make sure that it's it's all connected the way it's supposed to. Yeah, absolutely. A big job. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, comprehensive. And, and we have some reports that can help with that. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll be in touch with you about that. <laughs> <laughs> to, um, I don't see any other questions in. Oh, let's see. Q&A. Um, yeah, here's a question. Is Dublin Core your recommendation for meta tagging web pages? Um, I find it to be the most helpful. It's the ones that the librarians, from what I've understood, use the most. Um, we um, we started using Dublin Core, um, I think it was three years ago, on the web site, and our site stats have increased a little. We also do use the regular Google tags also. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks again, Joanne. Adora, back thank to you, you for, for last and final, I think. Yes. Thank you, Joanne, for that. Um, last but not the least, we have Amanda French, uh, who's going to talk to us about all things Roar. Over to you, Amanda. Thank you, Madura. I'm very glad to be here. My name is Amanda French. I am the Technical Community Manager for Roar, the Research Organization Registry, um, which is one of the persistent identifiers that, um, as Joanne said, helps to keep metadata intact as it flows through systems. I found that a really great way of expressing it. Sometimes it's hard to explain what is so important about persistent identifiers. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you um, specifically about the overlap between ROAR and the Open Funder Registry, which um, has also been historically known as Fundref. Next slide. So as some of you may have seen, the Open Funder Registry and ROAR are merging. Uh, we issued this announcement in September, and um, you may know that the Funder Registry has been around for, I think, a little bit more than 10 years. And thanks to the generous curation services of Elsevier and the uh, sort of operational support of Crossref, um, I think the Funder Registry has been quite widely used uh, and uh, in scholarly communication. And it's really made some wonderful strides in terms of identifying funders that are um, that have contributed to the production of certain research outputs. Um, so Crossref has said they will continue to support the funder registry at least through the end of 2024. So this is not anything that's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, and in fact, as you'll see, Roar has been working to really uh, reconcile the two registries and merge them and make sure that um, the data that's in the funder registry is also in ROAR. Next slide. So here is a sample ROAR record. Um, this is from our web interface. Of course, ROAR does also have an API, but we also have a nice pretty web user interface. There's the ROAR ID at the top of the record. Um, this is a record for a fairly significant funder, the American Cancer Society. And you can see that ROAR records do also include mappings to other identifiers, including funder IDs. So there's the Crossref funder ID for the American Cancer Society right there in the ROAR record. Next slide. Uh, Crossref's funder search um, is a really useful tool that will uh, can help you see, here are the Crossref records that acknowledge a particular funder as uh, having contributed to that research, uh, you can see that that actual funder ID is in the URL uh, because that's what's powering this search for works that have been funded by the American Cancer Society. There are over 9,000 uh, works registered with Crossref uh, that acknowledge the American Cancer Society as a funder. And you can also probably see here that um, both of these records that show on this page uh, have also been funded by other organizations, right? So a funding assertion um, is what we say, uh, you know, this particular work asserts a particular funder as one of the funders, but most works have multiple funding assertions. That's important to know. And that each organization uh, only has one ID. So with that distinction in mind, next slide. 
Ever since uh, about mid-2022, WAR has been working to make sure that funder, ID, uh, funder registry records and metadata are represented in ROAR. Uh, so we've prioritized um, sort of funders that have the largest number of funding assertions in Crossref. So these tend to be very large funders um, that fund many, you know, many, many um, research projects and are cited many times in Crossref metadata. Uh, and you can see here that for over 94% of funder ID assertions in Crossref records, there is a corresponding ROAR ID. Um, you can see uh, that that's represented in the green and pink graph. Um, the blue and orange graph is specifically about matching of funder IDs to ROAR IDs. So there are about 54% funder IDs that have matching ROAR IDs. But again, that 54% includes um, the most commonly cited funders. So most of those 45% um, those of funder IDs that are not matched to ROAR IDs are probably quite small funders that are only mentioned once or twice in Crossref metadata. Next slide. Um, this tool uh, that I'm showing you screenshots of is available for you to play with. I will actually put the link in the chat right here. Uh, you can go to it right now. I will say it might, you never know with these things, they might crash if everybody goes to it at once, <laughs> but uh, it is in general fairly stable. So uh, if, you know, if, you, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Um, one of the things you can do with that tool is to just look at that aggregate overlap as we just saw on the last slide. Uh, but here you can also see that you can look up Crossref members. So usually publishers, not always, but usually publishers whose works make funding assertions. So here you can see that the Crossref member Oxford University Press um, has uh, about you know, over 361,000 funding assertions in the works that it has registered with Crossref and that over 96% of those funding assertions can be mapped to ROAR IDs. Um, now that those 361,000 assertions um, are asserting uh, over 13,000 funder IDs and about 73% of those funder IDs are matched to ROAR IDs. So again, it's important to note that um, when there is a funder ID that isn't matched to a ROAR ID, that's probably because it's only mentioned once or twice in Crossref metadata. And I do want to uh, emphasize here too, that we're not finished reconciling the funder registry with ROAR, uh, that work continues. So we're hoping to um, narrow those gaps even more. Next slide. Um, you can also use uh, this tool at that URL just to look up individual funders by name and find their funder ID and find their corresponding ROAR ID. You can look at the ROAR record. And in fact, even from the tool, if you see any errors in the ROAR record, you can request a correction. Um, so that's a useful, helpful thing. Next slide. Um, so the thing that we really want you to take away from this is that uh, even though this is a fairly significant change um, with the funder registry sort of merging into ROAR, we think ROAR is really ready to take on this work of identifying funders. We know that many people, probably including the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, have built funder IDs into their workflows. Uh, and we know that it's gonna be a sort of a significant effort to transition that to ROAR, but we really think that, that it's going to be worthwhile in the long run. It's going to create efficiencies because you can use ROAR for other purposes besides identifying funders. Um, so just, uh, and then maintaining one registry instead of two is going to be beneficial for all. ROAR is ready to do that work and we're happy to work with you. Um, if you are a current user of the funder registry, uh, we'll tell you anything you like to know about ROAR. Next slide. That's all. Thank you very much. I want to mention in particular that this um, very fun funder registry tool that I've been showing you was built by Roar's uh, really wonderful curation lead, Adam Buttrick, uh, who has also been doing a lot of this terrific curation work to make sure that these registries are merged. That's all. Thanks, Amanda. We have time for maybe one question. Let's see. Um, will metadata for existing objects need to be updated to use ROAR instead of funder IDs? Uh, eventually, yes. 
Um, it's, it's a surprisingly complicated question. Um, so one of the things that Crossref is working on is doing automatic matching of funder IDs to raw IDs in Crossref metadata. Um, that's quite technically possible. Um, there's still a lot to be worked out before that actually goes into production. So, um, you know, you can keep sending funder IDs to Crossref and that will continue to work for at least at least through the end of 2024 and probably quite a bit beyond that. And the likelihood is that what will happen is that Crossref will say this funder ID, you know, is the same as this raw ID and will assert that in Crossref metadata. Now, that being said, the funder registry will cease to be updated at some point so that data will get more and more stale. So you will, you will want to transition to ROAR eventually. Um, but yes, I think there's no, I think the other message that I hope you take away from this is that there's no rush to do this, but sometimes, you know, overhauling systems can take a while. We wanted to give people, you know, quite a lot of, of notice. So if you want to start on this now, um, you might as well. And we're we're hoping as well, I mean, I think, uh, in some of the earlier sessions, we saw that an increasing number of Crossref members are adopting ROAR for author affiliations, right? Um, which is a really important use case for ROAR. So if you haven't yet started using ROAR for author affiliations and you've been meaning to get around to that, which is what I hear from a lot of people, this, you know, you may you might want to do them both at once. You might say, we're going to start using ROAR for author affiliations and in the same process, transition from funder IDs to ROAR. So, yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Good suggestion. I think that's that's time. No more questions. Back to you, Madara, to wrap us up. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. And thank you, Isaac. Uh, so we're almost at time. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers today for sharing all the updates about the exciting work that they have been doing. Uh, I also want to thank the audience for being with us here today. And thank you also if you have attended any of the other sessions today as part of Crossref's annual meeting. Um, so this brings us to the end of this session. Um, I want to congratulate all of our newly elected Crossref board members and want to thank all of the speakers uh, today at Crossref's annual event for sharing their time and expertise with us and all of our community. Thanks are due to all the product managers at Crossref for the product demonstrations that they shared with us earlier in the day. Um, thanks also to everyone at Crossref who has been helping with technical support for all the sessions, including monitoring chat and Q&A during all the sessions. Um, as we said before, the outputs from the meeting will be available in the next few days. Um, again, huge thanks to everyone, um, but we are not done yet. Um, please join us for an unplugged session on spatial chat to mingle, connect, and continue the conversation about Crossref and Crossref's annual event. Uh, the link to join the session has been shared in the chat as well, and I hope to see some of you there. Thanks again.